Here I am at the spectacular Wherry Lagoon. And of all places, I'm going to talk about testing and refining our prototypes again and again in order for us to implement probably be competing with the seagulls there but that's okay I think we constantly have to be reminded about technology because uh, in contrast nature is just something <laughs> out of this world we can artificially recreate that but it's not the same So, let's step back a bit. What's all this for? Why do we go through steps of problem definition, aligning with stakeholders, engaging stakeholders, interviewing focus groups, eliciting the collection of data, understanding user needs, going through a process of discovery, offering a value proposition. conducting a proof of concept, organizing scenarios, storyboarding, you name it, towards prototyping. Because there's a solution to be implemented. And there are sort of two major processes at play here. One is the get business process that many commercial organizations entertain, something that's real. And the other is the do business process, but that's really the commercial realm, right? That's not public interest. Get business means you're getting business and doing business is doing it, implementing, watching it go to operation. But there's something else about public interest tech. It's not about getting business. Perhaps it's about getting serious and building things that matter to people, building things that people need. And the doing business is actually living. It's not actually doing business, it's survival. It's ensuring that what we see around us here today actually stays here in about a hundred years. I want my grandkids to grow up enjoying the same joys that I have. But the truth is most of us are stuck inside designing or building or doing something in laboratories or in office spaces and we're foregoing this wonderful, incredible world of ours that exists today. So, in the commercial realm, you go through a request for information as a vendor. So there's an operator or service provider that needs something, they call for a request for information. And then there's a request for proposal, tell us what you want us to get, want to give us. And then finally a request for quotation. And along each of these steps, things get more and more serious. And RFI is more like a service provider looking five to ten years down the track, you know, even three years at some, some times. But requests for information, like we're trying to get um, future demands of services in the networking world, which is my world where I've come from, and we're trying to think big, like what, what could that be in the future? And then we go from an RFI to a request for proposal, an RFP. That gets a little bit more serious. Like the service provider is asking you, tell us exactly, forget about the idea that you had, you know, a year out or two years ago, now we want you to give us a proposal for the services that we've identified and post the request for proposal is usually a terse request for quotation, an RFQ. And the RFQ expects levels of detail. I remember when we used to print all these things out in the late 90s and 
we're talking about seven large arch or eight large arch files full of design specs quite detailed network designs network architectures and solutions and information on products and service level agreements contract information costing budgeting business case data um, market and services demand estimates literally to the actual number of households or users by by area confirmed by geographic zone and so at the end of this you'd be shortlisted maybe there were three in the shortlist and you'd be given an opportunity to present at that final stage and sometimes it'd be a second round if the service provider was like no we're not playing ball with this kind of budget there'd be a correction in the overall estimate and then we'd be asked to return and those were always interesting to me as a young person in their early 20s watching CFOs uh, have it out with our country managers or our product managers or our business developers was always a very interesting thing and I was taught very early on you know some people are fantastic at doing this but they can't get the contract signed and getting somebody responsible from the service provider or operator to sign millions of dollars away in fact 10 billion over 10 years in one case which didn't happen, we lost the bid, is really complex to even conceive of. It's not your money, but you are an employee. So there must be sort of vested interests involved in this process. Commissions, people wanting to sell more. People wanting to see emerging services implemented in society, making big change to the world. But. I don't think public interest tech is about that. It's not about boasting that you have the biggest, you've, you've won the biggest bid in the Southern Hemisphere as I was part of. Well, who cares? In one case, yeah, we won the biggest bid, we implemented, and then when the implementation went pear-shaped because of Australia's topology, the system was switched off. There goes that 500 million, 500 million. I don't hear too many people talking about that. So implementing literally means you're rolling out. So if I look at the network scenario or analogy I'm using, you're literally going to dig, dig and dig up roadways. So there's things called rights of way or a right of way. Rights of way include sewage pipes. They include train lines, electricity grids. They include anything that allows you to lay fiber or some kind of electronic physical interface somewhere and so we were always looking for rights of way both in Sydney and across the world is there a right of way there that would make the project cost less and then the flip side of that is when we, we went started to go wireless in the early 2000s and thought forget about digging up the road that's too expensive at one stage in Australia down Sydney City we had two providers of cable television literally ripping up the road twice on major crossways in the city which just caused massive congestion for about a year didn't it make sense for one provider to lease to the other and say we've covered this street how about you go to the next suburb or go north and let's limit our costs no they had to dig up the same piece of road fascinating all of these learnings and so wireless came in and we had coverage. All of a sudden, we could deploy faster. And as time went on, our speeds increased in terms of how much data throughput you could have on wireless broadband. But implementation on large scale means major disruption, incredible levels of planning and execution and making sure that 
the products that you promised the service provider actually exist. A lot of companies haven't got fully developed products by the time that they need to implement. And there are delays at times in the rollout of an agreed plan because of these delays. But rollout plans are really important. They can make or break a business case. Knowing which phase of the deployment you're going to do at which stage. And the same goes for PIT. If we're going beyond local solutions at scale towards large scale implementations and rolling out across the world, for example, a particular process or rolling out a product in different markets, you better do that in the right order to recoup your costs. It's a big thing in uh, business cases. Payback periods, internal rates of return, loans, net present values. Because what you need to do is some, in some way recoup those costs. And a lot of business people talk about three reasons why you'd offer a new solution. The first is to gain more revenue. The second is cost optimization. And the third is compliance, safety, and other regulations. But in public interest tech, the first two may not be viable. It's not probably why you're doing something. You're not introducing a public interest technology to garner revenue. You hope to get some revenue to allow the system to be sustainable on its own over time. But that's not the primary aim, right? Public interest tech is not about revenue generation. It can be, but it usually isn't. Is it about cost optimization? Could be. Depends if it's a process embedded in a democratic process. And compliance? Yeah, maybe. But we've got to come up with reasons that are not tied to money. And that's a good enough reason to me. Look at that. You've still got to prove in the intangibles. But banks seek, seek to quantify things. They have to, they're a bank. But what are the other social infrastructures that we're going to develop that are not like banks, in order to reinvest back into this. So I'll leave you with those reflections on implementation and say, as a network designer, I was always, you know, got a bit of a jig in my step when I saw the, the technology in the field. But that didn't last very long. What lasts a long time, I hope, is this. I'm Katina Michael from Arizona State University. I'm the program chair of the Masters of Science in Public Interest Tech. And this session, I'm running PIT 502, co-designing the future. If you're even a little bit interested in PIT 502 or the greater course on public interest tech, why don't you send me an email at katina.michael at asu.edu. That's Katina spelled K-A-T-I-N-A. Look forward to hearing from you.